Well, good morning. Boy, that was great. I had to get the ask the uh, earlier service, see if I wake them up. They said I had to ask them twice if it was a good morning. So it is great to see you in the house of the Lord. It seems like fall has come a little bit, doesn't it? A little bit. It's great. If you have not assigned the uh, attendance pads located in your pews, please do so and pass them down. Um, it is wonderful to see you in the house of the Lord this morning as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Um, keep our senior pastor in your prayers. As many of you may know, he, he uh, lost his mother this past week. And uh, even though he knew that, that the family knew that that was probably coming it's still never easy, so keep, keep him in your prayers. Also, keep uh, Steve and Carol Budden and Marty and Bob Johnson and, and uh, Martha and Larry Bailey in your prayers. As they need our fervent prayers as they're in their health concerns that they have. The altar flowers today are given to the glory of God in honor of the 50th wedding anniversary of Kent and Carol Lee. 50 years, that's wonderful. That's wonderful and beautiful, beautiful um, flowers. The, the National Day of Prayer Planning Committee is going to start on Thursday, September 28th at 6.30. If you were here this past year, I think it was what, was the past May that we had it, it was a wonderful time. The Fellowship Hall was packed to the gills, had a great message from various pastors and then also the head of, uh, of Charleston, the president of Charleston Southern, Dr. Don D. Costin who's no longer with us, he's the president of Liberty now, but it was, a, it was a great time. So if you're interested in being a part of that, please come on Thursday, Thursday the 28th at 6.30. Habitat for Humanity Workday is coming up, and that'll be on Saturday, September 30th, 8 a.m. to 12. And if you need more information, um, contact Barney Duncan, I think in the back of your bulletin, there's an email address and phone number for him as well. One more announcement. Karen, come on up. Good morning, I'm Karen Thompson, and a year ago, I stood up here to inform you about our new Bethany Gift and Gourmet Market, not knowing how it was gonna turn out. And thanks to all of you, it was a roaring success. We made $29,000 for missions. And I'd like to double that this year. So, <laughs> um, uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about the different components of the market. It's going to be held October the 25th to November the 5th, and it will be on Wednesday through Sunday of those two weeks. Um, the different components are, we have um, our craft section, which is our most very popular section. Um, if you're a crafty person, would like to make something, get sewing or get crafting. Um, we also have our scrumptious desserts, um, cakes, pies, cookies, holiday treats. And we added a new component last year um, for tailgate items, salty things, nuts. And it, it was a big hit, so we'd love for you to add that to your list, too. And our newest um, component was um, casserole. They were, we had two sections, Bethany favorites and family favorites. And we also had uh, June's chicken salad, that's coming back. And we were also gonna add a sort of a, a, not as fancy of a chicken salad to put on sandwiches. And then we have a Southern Living recipe of pimento cheese that we're going to do. Um, we also encourage you to get a slice of dessert, a cookie or a piece of cake or pie, and go to our social room with your friends and have a cup of coffee and just enjoy some fellowship. Um, so how can you help? First of all, we need your prayers. We're doing this all for the glory of God and for our missions. So we need you to keep us in prayer. Um, we need for you to make casseroles. Um, we have our family favorites, which are anything that you would like to make. A grandmother's recipe, an uncle's recipe, breads, a hearty salad, anything like that. And please attach your recipe with your family favorite because two reasons. There might be some allergies, and also people love them so much they would come back to us last year and say, what was the recipe for that? And if we don't have it, we can't share. And then we have Bethany favorites, which are our um, chicken casserole and baked spaghetti casserole. And those recipes are online or on the big table by the stairs. Um, 
with desserts, we need at least 20 desserts a day. So like I said, anything sweet you would like to make or a tailgate item. Um, so please um, think about that. And then also, we need for you to work in the kitchen. Um, we're going to be making the chicken salads and the pimento cheese every day. So if you like to cook, it's a great opportunity for you to help in that way. And then also, our gift shop needs helpers to set up and then also to sell items during the day. Um, Sharing the Bethany Post on your social media and your neighborhood social media really helps to spread the word. We had a wonderful support from the community last year, and we want to have that again this year. Um, the Sunday before the um, market starts on October the 22nd at 11 a.m., we'll be tearing down Word and Table. So if you'd like to help us do that, we'd appreciate that. Then on Monday and Tuesday, October 23rd and 24th, we'll be starting around 10 o'clock, getting everything set up for the market, if you'd like to help there. Then at the very end, on Monday, November the 6th, if you want to help clean up and pack everything back up, we'd appreciate your help too. So we just can't thank y'all enough for your support last year, and I'm looking forward to a great year this year. Thank you. Amen. Would you stand for our call to worship? Join with me in our opening hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, number 127.
please join me as we affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You want to come up, Parker? Okay. Olivia, is she up there, temperance? Y'all want to come down? All right, come on, let's sit down. How's everybody this morning? We're going to wait just a second for Olivia to make her way down. But as she's doing that, how was your week? Good. So who remembers last week what we did? It was I know Parker and Austin were here. Do you remember what we did last Sunday? What was it about? It was about forgiveness. So we had a, um, a bottle that we put in different colors, and they represented different things like anger. Come on, Olivia. Anger, sadness, or when we might hurt somebody's feelings. And then we had a balloon that represented Jesus, and it sucked everything out. And we said that Jesus can be the one to suck out all that anger and sadness and hurt. Um, so this week we're talking about fairness, which is another hard thing that we have Sometimes it's, it's hard when things aren't always fair. But in um, Matthew 20, Jesus writes us a parable. Does anybody remember what a parable is? A parable is just a story that Jesus uses to teach us a lesson. Okay, and it's Matthew 20, so y'all can go home and pull your Bibles out and read it again. But basically it's about this man, let's call him Bob, and he owns a bunch of land, and he needed people to work in the field. So Bob goes to the city, and he finds these folks just sitting around and doing nothing. And he, he says, if you come and work in my field, I'll pay you a day's wage. And it was early in the morning. So the people came, and they worked in his field. So then about 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, Bob went back out to the city and found some more folks just standing around doing nothing. So they came back, worked in the field. He did the same thing around lunch, and then around at 3, and then again at like 5. So then at the very end of the day, he calls the last to the first that had been working, and he paid them all the same wage, the same amount of money for everybody. And the guy that had been working there all morning was like, that is not fair, Bob. Bob said, well, it's my money, and you agreed to work for a day's wage, and this is what we get. So I thought, what is the point that Jesus wanted to know about for us to, why is it important that he wrote that parable? Well, life is not fair. Some people, like us, may lo love the Lord from a young age, and they serve him the, their whole life. But guess what their reward is? Eternity in heaven. Other folks might be the laborers that came in at the very end of the day. At the very end of their life, they sought Jesus, 
they served the Lord in their last hours of their life. And guess what their reward is? It's the same exact thing. We both get the same reward. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that grace isn't fair. It's not fair that Jesus died on the cross either. And the Bible tells us that we're all going to fall short from God's grace. But Jesus went to the cross, which was not fair. But by God's grace, he rose again. That same grace is given to us because we all are going to fall short. We're all going to stumble. We're all going to sin. But with Jesus, we're all going to be forgiven. That, that bottle's going to be emptied out again because of that grace. So next time something happens and things are not fair, just kind of remember back to that parable. Things will be even in the long run, right? You just keep living, living for Jesus, doing the right thing. All right, let's say a prayer. Dear God, we thank you that life is not fair because we know that in the end, your grace is good enough, that your grace is where we're going to live in heaven forever. Lord, help us to live like you. Even when we stumble, help us to get back up. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for grace. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen.
This morning, our first lesson comes from Psalm 118, verses 14 through 29. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and I will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. And he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the feastal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that in your grace we have faith in Lord Jesus, the precious cornerstone on whom our faith is founded. Thank you that Jesus was willing to come to earth and be despised and rejected so that he could become the rock on which we stand. We praise and thank you for your goodness and grace, your kindness, loyalty, and deliverance in times of trouble. Thank you that in Christ we need not fear those that would oppress and destroy us. We thank you for providing healing in times of trouble, comfort in times of sorrow, light in times of darkness, freedom for those that are enslaved. Restoration for all that are brokenhearted, strength in days of weakness, and hope in times of distress. We give thanks unto the Lord, for you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, please grant us your wisdom this coming week and help us to stay focused on you. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
Heavenly Father, accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture lesson today is taken from 2 Samuel, the ninth chapter, the first through the 14th verse, 13th verse. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's in the household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There's still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Makur, son of Mil in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Makur to the son of the son of Emil. And when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show kindness for your father, Jonathan. I will store to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and he said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth's grandson, and Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were the servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. The word of God for the people of God. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be holy and acceptable to you. Um, some weeks ago, as I knew this, uh, that I was going to be here with you in the sanctuary services, I was praying about, God, what, what do you want me to preach on? I mean, we, I know we always got the lectionary that we follow. and I said, but Lord, what do you want me to preach on? And a couple things I felt like the, the Holy Spirit kind of urged me to do. One was, you remember when we had um, New Member Sunday a couple Sundays ago? And uh, in the uh, Word and Table service, we welcomed a new member. This, uh, this, we had a couple new members, but this particular one was, has, was a recently became a Christian, was a convert from another religion, Islam. I heard the hmm out there. And I remember as we had talked and, and had some time together before that, I, I said, what, what, what was it? I mean, I knew it was the love of Jesus Christ, but what was it that made you convert from, from Islam to Christianity? And by the way, when this person had made this conversion, he pretty much lost his family. They kind of shunned him completely. He was no longer a part of them. Now, you're probably thinking, what was the one word that he told me? If he had said Jesus, it would have been no surprise to any of us. But he did say Jesus in a different way. The word was grace. Grace. 
the uh, youth and the, the youth sang this morning and also the children's choir. And uh, one of the things that the children, what the children's choir sang was your grace. And uh, Mary Lynn said, well, we just need to stop the sermon right now. Stop the service. It's done. We're going to have the benediction. I kind of felt that same way when you were singing How Great Thou Art. <laughs> I wanted to stand up, you know, and I've been in churches when they started singing like that. They bring out the towels and start singing. But God's grace, uh, a couple months, about a month or so ago, I'd finished up a sermon series in, in uh, Spell and Word and Table, and it was on grace. And one of the sermons I preached is from this very passage. So you're not getting leftovers. You're kind of getting an, something I felt like God put on my heart again. And this is from, as you see, as David, as David is at the peak of his, his time as the king. Before, before I get into this passage, I need, to, I need to back up a couple chapters. I want to read one verse out of chapter 4, 2 Samuel. This gives you a little bit of background on the, who this Mephibosheth guy is. Chapter 4, verse 4. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old. And when the news about Saul and Jonathan came... From Jezreel, his nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. Now, what had taken place, as you may know from your Sunday school lessons, is, is that David became the king at last. Saul had been the king, Saul's son, Jonathan. But the news had come to them that the, for the family of Jonathan and Saul that said that uh, they were dead. Jonathan and Saul had been killed in battle. Now what happened back then, and it's still kind of, and we see it in other places in the Old Testament, and we still see it, believe it or not, in some places in the world today. But when a new king, a new dynasty came on scene, if there was any family members or leaders from the old dynasty, you know what they did to them? They killed him. They killed him. So, this caretaker, this nurse for the son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth, when he was five, the news came to her. You saw, you read, you heard the verse, the words in chapter four. She either grabbed him by by the hand and started dragging him. Let's get out of here. I know none of you parents have never done that. Or she picked him up. Or they both went running. But somehow, in their escape that they thought the pending death that was coming, he fell. And it must have been a horrible fall because he became crippled in both feet. Now, fast forward almost 20 years. David, David is at the peak, as I said a few minutes ago, of his, of his dynasty as the king. Everything is going well. He is... Uh, He's feeling like, you know, he's lots of integrity. The boundaries of his kingdom expanded tenfold. It went from 6,000 to 60,000. He has the greatest military, and his warriors are at peace with one another. It's, this is before Bathsheba, by the way. It is great times. He is sitting back, and he's thinking, wow, wow, I'm blessed. Now, let me pause for a moment. Some of you are at a similar point in life. You feel like you're at a point to enjoy life. That's good. Times when you think about this journey that's got you to where you're at now. And those who you, who've helped you to get there. Are you thinking about anybody that's helped you to get to this point? I see some heads nodding. I know some people that come to my mind right away. This past, this past week, I did a, a funeral for a military spouse at Arlington. And you know, as traditionally as we do at any funerals, we, we talk about the impact that the deceased had on our, on the, our lives. This particular military spouse was stationed in Hawaii in the mid-70s. And the Vietnam War was coming to an end. And there was something called Operation Baby Lift or Operation Baby, something like that. Anybody remember that? We've got three hands in here that remember. Well, what happened was all these orphan babies 
and young children that were in Vietnam, we rescued them. We put them on military planes. We put them on charter planes, and we brought them back to the U.S. But they stopped in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, you had all these, these military spouses and medical court. They would go and take care of these babies, tend to these babies for a certain amount of time before they went back on their flight coming to here to the U.S. Well, this particular, this particular person that we were honoring this past week, she had been one of the first spouses on those planes. And she held this malnourished, dehydrated little child and cared for cared for him for for some time until they he they took him on to here to the u.s now why am i telling you this story about a month or so ago that same child who's now a grown man who is a responsible successful u.s citizen contacted the family and he he had heard he had found out somehow that she had held him and taken care of him. And he told the husband, he said, I just want to tell you thank you. He said, I don't remember, but thank you. The impact that, you know, that she, she loved and cared for me at this time in my life. What, what a tribute to somebody. What a tribute. And I imagine many of you have got somebody in your life that's done the same for you or that you have done for them. That is where David's at right now. So he says, who, who can I express my gratitude and show kindness that I am a grateful man of where I'm at? And you hear the words, he went to the this, this servant of Saul who was still alive, Ziba, and he says, is there anyone living from the family of Saul or Jonathan that I can say thank you to. And as you heard me say, and I kind of emphasized it, he said, yeah, there is this son of Jonathan, and, you know, he's crippled in both feet. You probably don't want to give him, this is my words, you probably don't want to give him anything. He doesn't deserve anything. But he didn't ask if he deserved anything. He says, send him to me, bring him to me. By the way, the, if you noticed, the land where they were at, where Mephibosheth was at, was a place called Lodabar. Lodabar literally means a, no pasture land, a barren land, a wasteland. That's where he's at. And, and King David says, bring him from Lodabar to me. It's king sent for him. And can you only imagine, as is now probably 20-year-old, 25-year-old, 26-year-old man who's crippled, who knows who David is, the most powerful man on the planet at that time. He's coming before him, <laughs> and David says, don't be afraid. I think if I was Mephibosheth, I would be a little afraid. By the way, you know what one command that Jesus made more than any other command in Scripture? I've kind of told you the answer. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Bethany, I'm telling you right now. Don't be afraid. Do we believe in how great thou art? I know I'm kind of meddling a little bit here. Getting off, off track. Do we believe that God is the God of the universe? So, David says, don't be afraid, for I will show you grace, restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather. Fear would be expected, but don't be afraid. I remember one time as a, uh, as a chaplain, and I was, at, I was out of this place called Yokota Air Force Base. It was right outside of Tokyo, Japan. I was one of the senior chaplains there, and I remember I was going about my daily business, and I got, I, got a, I got a call to our secretary from the secretary in the wing commander's office. It says, the wing commander wants to see you. I'm going, oh my goodness. You know, when you get summoned to the wing commander's office, it's usually not a good thing. 
Sandy Mills is shaking her head back there. She knows. It's usually not a good thing. I'm thinking in my head as I'm walking over there. It wasn't a very long walk. It was about three or four blocks to get to the wing commander's building. And I was wondering, well, maybe it's because I met with the Wiccans were wanting to worship on the base. And they were meeting with me. Or maybe it was because there were so many young Japanese that were wanting to come to our, our teenagers and young Japanese that were wanting to come to our worship services. That's a great, great thing. But it was also a security issue. So I'm wondering all these things. Oh my goodness, am I going to get fired? Is my career over? What's going to happen? And I come into him and I say, sir, you know, I, I know that you wanted to see me. And he said, sit down. Yes, sir. He says, you've been chosen to go to a very elite school in leadership with others chosen Air Force officers. And uh, I just wanted to be the first to let you know. And I'm thinking, how in the world did this happen? <laughs> it's not what I expected. I can only imagine a hundred times that's what Mephibosheth was thinking. He's standing in front of this mighty king. He's crippled. He's kin to the people that tr for 14 years had tried to get rid of him. And he says, I want to show you grace, and I want to give you everything that your grandfather and your father had. Woo! Man! He expected he might be punished or die, but it was grace. He says, what me, a dirty dog like me, living in a waste man, land? Have you ever said that to God? You're going, God, really? Wow. Wow. Then the king called Ziba, Mephibosheth. He says, we'll always eat at my table. Grace and tablecloth will cover his feet. It doesn't matter that he's a cripple. He's, he is part of my family. He is part of mine. You know, as, John, as God's children, we've been adopted, grafted in. We are his. And all David's family sits down for dinner at the king's table. Can you only imagine this? I don't know if you know about, the, if you know the, about David's family. He had these, these awesome sons. He had this one son who was just, they said he was just unbelievably handsome. He had another son who was a great warrior. He had a daughter that was beautiful. And then there was Solomon, the wise one. And can you imagine? They all come in. They're sitting down at David's table. And then you hear this... Mephibosheth coming in. But you know what? He was part of the family. He was part of the family. Today they would all be singing Amazing Grace, Once Was Lost, But Now I'm Found. And why do you think this story, which is a little kind of obscure story, is in the Bible? We get the little glimpse in chapter 4 of what happened to him. Now we get the, a whole chapter in not, chapter 9 that tells about him, and then we don't hear about him again. It's kind of like the prodigal son in the Bible. It's showing that God's love and His grace is so amazing. Today, again, we'd all be singing Amazing Grace. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. Through many dangers, tolls, and snares, I've already come. It is grace that has brought me safe thus far, and grace will bring me home. I want to tell you, I, be, I was very fortunate I grew up in a very blue-collar family, but I had a mom and dad that loved the Lord and took me to church, and I became a Christian at an early age. I know for many people that is not the case. I grew up and had a great teenage years. They weren't perfect, and I sure wasn't perfect. I was so blessed to serve God and country as a military chaplain, and I'm even more blessed to be a minister here at Bethany. I don't deserve it. I have it because God chose to give it. <laughs> grace. Grace. God's grace. That made everybody smile. Great, it's greater than all our sins. I don't deserve it. He gave it. And maybe you haven't been as low as some, but who's comparing depravity? Maybe your failures is not their failures, but in God's eyes, it's all failures. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Maybe not crippled in your feet, 
or in your hands, but we are all crippled in our hearts. David adopted Mephibosheth into his family and gave him status at the table. And so we, too, have been adopted by amazing grace with promises of joy and unconditional love that we should share with others. We should reflect that same. I know sometimes it's hard. I just, I just came from D.C. where everybody's mad and everybody's in a hurry. <laughs> and everybody wants to run you off the road. Sometimes it's kind of like that on Ashley Frustrated. But grace, God's grace, this world needs God's grace. We need it. We have been given it. The limping was a reminder of grace for all of David's family. A reminder for us not to judge our brother for limping or our sister. Encouraging your brother or sister who is at the table as David did to Mephibosheth like he was a son. Someday there will be a reenactment of the scene. And we will all gather at the great table. And the tablecloth will cover all of our feet. Now I'm going to mention... Uh, a vocal group, probably most of you don't know, because y'all are a lot more like the high music kind of stuff. Don't have show me grace. The Gaither Band. One of the songs I can remember hearing when I was a young kid. It's Oh yes, oh yes, I'm a child of the King. His royal blood now flows in my veins. I who was wretched was born now can sing. I am a child of the king. You are a child of the king. Amen? Oh, there's a few Baptists out there. Okay, pull your toes in. I wish we would treat one another as God treats us. Fellow Christians, sometimes it's... Fellow Christians sometimes are hard to live with. And we may not agree with them. But we can disagree without being disagreeable. And I am in not in no way saying that this, the word of God, who you heard me preach, I always hold up, should be compromised, overlooked. But we should show God's grace. If God placed demands on us that we do on one another, we would never make it to heaven. Ooh, it's pretty quiet in here. We need that phone to ring again. Let's pray. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like sea waves cold. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that's greater, yes, grace untold. Points to the refuge of the mighty cross. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can we do to wash it away? Look, there's a flowing crimson tide, brighter than snow you may be today. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Would you stand in our closing hymn? Great Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Number 671 in your hymnals.
I pray part of this, a lot more of these verses that we just sang is our benediction. Let us each thy love possess in triumph and redeeming grace. Oh, refresh us. Oh, refresh us through traveling through this wilderness. I pray, pray that you are refreshing, refreshing presence of grace in the people that come into your life. God bless you. Amen.